right. So I'm going to be talking about my primarily about my lucky imaging slash Steckel interferometry uh, pipeline uh, that I use to reduce data that I use to reduce data from the BOSS 0.8 meter telescope uh, that's owned and operated by LCOGT uh, in collaboration with Cal Poly and UCSB also. So first of all, just a little tiny introduction about the BOSS telescope. Uh, so here it is. It's in California near Santa Barbara. LA is right down here. San Francisco is up here. Um, you can see that the altitude is not very high, but it's actually a pretty dark site. So the seeing is not great, but the, the sky brightness is pretty good. Uh, and it's, it's got a fairly substantial instrumentation package. Uh, we have a main SBIG camera that's the workhorse. Uh, we have two smaller SBIG cameras that we use as simultaneous auto guiders. Uh, and then the primary one that we care about for this is the Andor Luca R. Um, it's got a two times Barlow to get us some extra magnification and then a bunch of filters. And a cool NRES shell spectrograph that's just got, that's just being commissioned. Okay, so just uh, one slide introduction to what lucky <laughs> imaging is. I'm sure a lot of you know what it is. But basically the concept is that you take uh, a bunch of images ranging, um, so your exposure times are generally 10 milliseconds. Uh, you do 10 to 30 hertz, 10 to 30 frames per second. Uh, you take 10,000 to 50,000 images, and then you select the best 5 to 0.5 to 5 percent of those frames. And that allows you to get down near the diffraction limit uh, for your telescope, uh, for small telescopes anyways, even in poor seeing conditions. Uh, and at Sedgwick, or BOSS, I'll be using those interchangeably for the same, same telescope, Sedgwick and BOSS. Uh, we generally get down to about quarter arc second resolution. Uh, and then this, this image here kind of illustrates that. So if you just take all of the images, or, uh, and then you just add them up, so this is essentially a long exposure image, you'd see something like that. Now if you select just the best ones, these are the best frames out of that uh, data cube. And if you just stack the best ones, then you can see something like this. There's a tripling artifact here that I can talk about later. And then the worst speckle images look like that. You guys can feel free to stop me during the talk if you have questions, short questions anyways. Um, OK, and then speckle interferometry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right, right. Uh, and it could be you know, some of the speckle could be in a different direction. Maybe every second it could be like the vibration, but there may be some error there. Uh, I think I'll get into that a little bit more in a later slide. If you still have that question at the end, then yeah, we'll come back to it. Um, okay, so the next step is speckle interferometry. Um, and in my pipeline, I use speckle interferometry simply as an analysis tool um, for the data. I don't reconstruct an image with the speckle interferometry. I just use these fringe patterns to measure the position angle and separation of the stars that I detected in the lucky imaging. Um, so the basic uh, process for speckle interferometry is you take a two-dimensional Fourier <coughs> transform of all the images, and you just stack them up. You just sum them up. And if you have a binary, you'll get a fringe pattern that looks like this. It's basically saying that there's more frequently things in the image that are by this amount in uh, spatial, spatial frequency. Uh, closer, the closer together these fringes are, actually mean larger separations. Uh, so in some cases, it's actually easier to measure closer ones. It's easier to fit the fringe patterns if they're bigger. Uh, you can use all of the images for this. You don't have to use the best images, although I do. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And so like I said, it's an analysis tool. But you have a 180 degree phase ambiguity. You don't know if the stars are aligned like that or if they're aligned, you know, if they're like, <coughs> My laser has 180 degree ambiguity also. <laughs> yeah, you don't know which side they're on. Though. OK, so now I'll discuss my whole pipeline. This slide is a bit uh, dense, so bear with me. So you start out with high cadence data, like I said, 10 to 30 hertz. You get nice speckles that look like that. And I start with my lucky imaging pipeline. <clears throat> so I select my frames, and I'll have slides kind of for all these individual points, and I'll go through them in more detail. Select the best frames. Uh, I shift and add to a common pixel reference frame. I shift them, and then I add them, just stack them up. Uh, and that leads to a high resolution image. Now, uh, if 
I only see one star in the high resolution image, well, then I'm pretty much done. I make a contrast curve out of that, and that's the result from that data set. Uh, if I see two stars clearly separated in the lucky imaging, and I can do simple centroiding analysis, um, just measuring the positions of the stars, then I can I'll directly measure the position angle and separation just using the centroids. However, if the peaks are somewhat blurred, um, or if they're close enough that centroiding doesn't work, then I have to go to the speckle interferometry uh, section of the pipeline, where I sum up all the two-dimensional Fourier transforms, I derotate that fringe pattern to find the position angle. At the same time I'm doing that, I'm iteratively calibrating it. I'm getting rid of the, the seeing envelope. And, uh, and then once I have the position angle, then I look at the frequency of those fringe, the oscillation of those fringe patterns, and that gives me the separation. Okay, so my frame selection. Um, the easiest and fastest method to do it, you simply look at the, how bright the brightest pixel in the image is. If you have high signal to noise data, the brightest pixel will always be from your star. So you just say that's how you judge the quality of the image based on how bright the brightest pixel is. Okay? Uh, you can also use cross-correlation, uh, which I was using a model Airy disk PSF and correlating it with, my, with each image and seeing the strength of the correlation, and that gives you an idea of the quality also. And then, like I said, you just select the best 0.5 to 5% of the frames, depending on the conditions and the brightness of the targets and such. And so this plot shows a histogram of the, the maximum counts. This is, this is when I just choose the maximum pixel, <coughs> and then the number of images at each of those peak counts. So peak counts is along here. So if you select you know, 1%, you're only looking at this, this region of the images, and you have a huge amount that you're wasting. That's the nature of lucky imaging. Okay, so my shift and add algorithm. Um, I can do sub-pixel alignment because I interpolate the images. I magnify them by a, a factor of two to four, generally two, um, before I find where the brightest pixel is. So you do a little bit of a linear interpolation. It allows you to do half-pixel alignment, essentially. Um, so you have the magnitude of that peak, and you know where the location of the peak is, and you align to those. Um, you can all, and you can also do cross-correlation cross to find the shifts also in the same way that you use it to uh, assess the image quality. Okay, so now we have a high resolution image. Uh, and like I said, about between 0.25 and 0.5 fold half max, depending on the conditions. You know. Okay, so now if we have a single star, I measure the contrast curve, like I said. So here's an example of a single star. And what I do to measure the contrast curve is I take concentric annuli, I look in circles around it, and I take the standard deviation along that annulus, and um, I can, detect, uh, I can um, determine a five sigma limit uh, based on that standard deviation. And I also do uh, inject and recovery, recovery is in quotes because it's recovery by eye, of uh, stars that would lie along this line. So I try to put stars in there and see if I can recover them by eye in a random place. Okay, and the centroiding uh, part of it is fairly simple. I use a source extractor uh, and just directly measure the position angle and separation. Uh, my pixel scale for my uh, detector is calibrated to well-characterized doubles, as I think a lot of you do. Um, I don't have any fancy techniques for that yet. And then I just do simple aperture photometry or PSF fitting photometry uh, with standard available packages. And I generally can do that. Uh, the seeing at Cedric, has, like I said, is pretty bad. So I can do this generally for separations that are like two arc seconds or greater. Otherwise, I have to go into the speckle interferometry. Um, <coughs> so like I said, you sum the two-dimensional Fourier transform. So if you took this two-dimensional Fourier transform of an individual image, it would look a lot like this, this image does here, a little bit less signal and noise. And then you stack them all together, and you get a nice, smooth, high signal and noise fringe pattern like this. You don't need to shift those, uh, those Fourier transforms because you're losing information at each point. So they're all on a single uh, standard reference frame as you take the Fourier transforms. And like I said, you lose the phase information. So when you have fringe patterns like that, you actually, what it actually means is that you have a star here and here, or here and here, okay? And so that angle gives you the, the position, but you don't know which side it is. 
And the amplitude of the fringes gives you the delta mag. And um, yeah, that's about all I have to say about that. Oh, so you don't need the 50, the 10,000 to 50,000 images for speckle and interferometry because you use every image. So what I do is I look through the, I take the images I use for luck imaging, which is generally you know 500 to 3,000, and I use those to do the speckle interferometry. Those are the higher signal and noise images. They have more well-defined speckles, and uh, that gives a higher signal and noise result for the speckles. If I didn't do the luck imaging, you could just use all the images and take less images. Okay, so to find the position angle, I do something that's um, a little bit, maybe a little bit unorthodox. I don't directly fit the fringe patterns. Instead, I start with an initial guess of the rotation angle. I rotate my fringe image by that amount, and I see, and then I flatten it along one axis. And that gives me a one-dimensional series uh, of oscillations, if I have it close to the right angle. I look at how deep the lowest of those minima are, and I plot that as a function of, of trial position angle. And you'll see that as you get close to the right position angle, that depth of the minima gets really small. It's, so look, if I had collapsed along that axis, you wouldn't have any minimum at all. It would be essentially flat. But if I collapse this way, then you have a nice oscillation pattern. So that minima gets deeper. So I, fit the, I find the minima of the minima, and that gives me the position angle. And a nice trick about that, um, well, you can use the image, it's the fringe pattern itself to do calibration, and you don't need to observe a single reference star. <coughs> so, at, so as I'm trying these rotation angles, at each, rota at each trial rotation angle, I fit a Gaussian along this axis. And I do that because in the original fringe pattern, you can see that it's heavily weighted towards the center. And that's due to the fact that you have these small speckles that gives you diffraction limited PSF, but in a larger envelope that's due to the seeing. Okay? So you want to get rid of that seeing envelope so you can just recover this, the fringe pattern. So as if, if I have the rotation angle right, and it's lined up along here, or if that one was lined up along here, it gives you a nice Gaussian envelope, and I fit. I fit that envelope and essentially assume rotational symmetry of the PSF, spin it around, and I make a nice Gaussian model um, and then you take the original fringe pattern, divide it by that model, and you get a fringe pattern like this that's nice and even and not centrally, centrally weighted. It's important to do that because you can bias your uh, separation measurement if it's not calibrated because that centrally weighting push your fringe patterns out and it underestimates your separation. Uh, I will say that it's probably better to observe a single star, but in a large program when you do this kind of robotically, uh, that's difficult to do to observe a, a star that's at the same air mass and get it all into your pipeline and your automation scheme. So this is a nice way to do it after the fact if you don't have reference stars. Okay, now now that I have the rotation angle, I know what axis to collapse this along. And when you collapse it, you have a nice oscillating pattern, like I said. And to get the separation, I just get the period of that oscillation. Okay, so I make a, a periodogram, which is essentially a one-dimensional Fourier transform, and you see that at this pixel separation, uh, which is converted into arc seconds, I have a huge spike in the power of that period. So there's a lot of information at that period, basically. That's the period of the oscillation, and that gives you your separation. Okay, so let me go through, again, the whole process. Start with your high cadence data. I do lucky imaging to extract, to see what's going on in the system. If it's a single star, if there's a double star, if I can detect it. If it's close like this, where I can't do standard centroiding and uh, aperture photometry techniques, then I go to speckle interferometry. I take the raw fringe pattern. I try rotation angles. As, I, as I'm doing that, I'm doing a self-calibration to get a nice even fringe pattern. And then I fit the, the minima of the minima to get the position angle. And then I look at the period of the oscillation to get the separation. OK, now I have a couple ideas for improvements, um, which I'll rush through. First of all, I would like to be able to put 
to implement the bispectrum analysis so I can go full image reconstruction from the spectral analysis. It's really the way to do it. It's, it is quite complex, I think, to implement in software. Which is why I haven't gotten around to doing it yet. <coughs> uh, doing a full two-dimensional fit of the fringe pattern, I think, is better than doing this rotation uh, uh, estimate method that I do. And I would like to be able to estimate the errors on the parameters I get, the rotation uh, or the separation position angle using Marco chain Monte Carlo techniques which you can uh, Google. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's also a new te uh, newer techniques coming out that involve blind deconvolution, which basically you can, it's, a, it's almost like speckle imaging. But uh, some of the early results I'm getting is, this is the same system here, and I do the lucky imaging, and then if I do the blind deconvolution, this is uh, just under half an arc second. And a fully robotic camera operation of the high-speed camera is, uh, would be nice also. Right now I have to op manually operate the camera. Uh, and uh, I think I will stop there and take any questions if you guys have. Uh, so, BJ, on do you think uh, for under what circumstances would it pay to kind of do this pre-filtering where you use kind of the the best lucky imaging uh, ones and then put that in, into the uh, speckle, you know, as opposed to trying to do all or take a shorter sequence? Um, I think only in really poor seeing conditions that will that'll help. Um, I, I think I've just seen that it works because that's, I start with the lucky imaging and I, I take a huge amount of images. So if you are doing that, if you have a huge amount of images, then you will get a higher signal noise result if you select just the best images. But otherwise, you don't you don't need to do that. Uh, for this system, then uh, how faint uh, with one meter telescope you can go? And the second is uh, when you reach to the close to faint limits, so you probably the strain ratio will be degraded a lot, uh, right? Can you yeah. some way you can you know specify. Um, well, the I don't have a, g a good quantitative measure of how much the stroll ratio decreases with brightness. Um, our limiting magnitude was also a bit controversial. We had a lot of problems with our mirror getting real dirty uh, out in this environment near, near, near the ocean. Um, it, we originally, I think it was looking <coughs> like 12 and a half magnitude. Uh, by the end of the couple of years I was doing this, it was looking more like ninth magnitude. Uh, so we think that that was all just to do to uh, dirt on the mirror. Um, <coughs> I was just wondering, what's wrong with the top 0.5 percent? The top? No, <laughs> I, I either select point, the best 0.5 percent, or at anywhere in the range of the best 0.5 percent to the best 5 percent. Okay, I'm not That's excluding good. the top 0.5. No. Okay, that makes more sense. Uh, your position angle is dependent upon the CCD array, knowing how it's positioned on yeah. the sky. What do you do for determining that position? I, I calibrate it to well-known doubles. Um, I observe a few per night. 